Good morning and welcome to Farm Factor. I'm your host, Jamie Bloom. On today's show, Dwayne Taves is discussing grazing strategies for stalker cattle with Keith Harmony. Then enjoy this week's Kansas soybean update. Next, Kyle Bauer treats us to a story about innovation with David Rosenberger with Arrow Farms. Then it's the Angus Report and we'll end with Plain Talk featuring Kyle and Dwayne. Stay with us. Closed captioning brought to you by Ag Promo Source. Together we grow. Learn more at agpromosource.com. This segment brought to you by Kansas Farm Bureau, the voice of agriculture. To join today or more information, go to kfb.org or find us on Facebook and Twitter. Welcome to Farm Factor. Up first today, Dwayne Taves is talking about grazing strategies on stalker operations with K-State rangeland expert, Keith Harmony. Dwayne Taves joining you once again on Ag AM in Kansas and a chance to catch up with Keith Harmony and talk a little bit about uh, grazing and uh, stalker cattle and, uh, and beef cattle operations, certainly grazing a big part uh, of the summer months, but it can be more than that, Keith. And I know you've looked at some different strategies uh, that producers maybe should be looking at. Yeah, one of the things that we've been studying at the Hayes Research Center, the, the Western Kansas Ag Research Center at Hayes, is a modified intensive early stocking system for stalker animals. And basically what that system has entailed is a combination of both intensive early double stocking and season long stocking to try to capitalize on the benefits of, of both of those uh, stocking strategies. So we're we're stocking animals at a 1.6x rate early in the season. So we have animals out on pasture when the forage tends to be highest in quality. We're removing the heaviest animals off those pastures at mid-season. And then we're leaving a typical 1x rate late in the season with lighter weight calves so that they can utilize their selective ability to be able to select the most nutritious plants and plant parts to, to be able to have uh, you know adequate gains during the late season to put on more weight. We think about uh, the realities of today that uh, we really need to, to get all we can in terms of profitability per acre. That has to require sometimes uh, some changes and some flexibility. Well, we, we did look at net return with this system to go along with production per acre. We were able to improve uh, production per acre each year on average uh, 26% with a 23% increase in stocking rate. So we're very efficient at, at uh, converting our stocking rate increase to production increase. But we did also look at net returns and three out of the seven years we had significantly greater net return with the modified system than we did with the um, season-long stocking system. And over the course of the seven years on average we uh, did have about uh, close to a 20 percent increase in net return from the modified system versus season long stocking. We think about uh, some of the reasons that uh, we adjust and alter those stocking rates obviously uh, we're at uh, the mercy of what kind of rainfall we get typically and what kind of grass production we have it's got to be sustainable and a, and a grass uh, crop the following year as well. Yeah we, we did look at sustainability um, increase in production per acre and net return per acre it it doesn't mean a lot if it's not going to be sustainable and so we did keep track of vegetative productivity on these pastures and looked at vegetative composition over time and we found that there was no effect of the grazing system or stocking system on vegetative productivity the two systems ended up having statistically equal production uh, and residual uh, forage in the pastures at the end of each grazing season and you know the vegetation that made up that production um, one of our key components is blue grama and another is side oats grama and the grazing system had no effect on their population those two changed in population in both systems according to the weather patterns the weather patterns of of, of the years and uh, didn't change because of the grazing system itself they were basically changed in accordance with each other due to the weather. Well, our thanks to Keith Harmony. Joining us on Ag AM in Kansas, Jamie, we'll send it back to you.
Thanks, Dwayne. Be sure to come back after these messages for this week's Kansas Soybean Update. Watch Ag AM in Kansas online at agamincansas.com. Kim Mandarin with Hardy Insurance. I'm here to help you with all of your farm and ranch needs. When it comes to protecting your operation and your family, you need a name you can trust at a price you can afford. Call me today or visit hardyaviationins.com. All over the country, more and more communities are making the change to biodiesel made from U.S. soybean oil. And the decision continues improving the health and welfare for millions of Americans while adding billions to our national economy. This segment is brought to you by the Kansas Soybean Commission. The Soybean Checkoff, progress powered by Kansas farmers. Welcome back to Farm Factor and the Kansas Soybean Update. This is the Kansas Soybean Update. It's brought to you by the Kansas Soybean Commission. The Soybean Checkoff, progress powered by Kansas farmers. Russell Plashka, Agribusiness Development Director with the Kansas Department of Agriculture, is joining us. And Russell, coming up on August the 23rd, it is the third annual Kansas Governor Summit on Agricultural Growth in Manhattan. We are very excited to host our third annual conference, Greg. Um, and it's and I say ours, it's really the industries as a whole conference. And we really look forward to it this year as we're really going to uh, drill down and focus in on some issues issues this year. What are some of the main things that's going to be discussed? Well, we've got our sectors broken into 19 different sectors, of course, and within those sectors, the past couple of years, we've really tried to hone in on what the objectives are and what some of the action items that needed to be prioritized. And from there, a lot of the things, we've had some successes here and there that we'll discuss during the summit and during those sector breakouts, but this year we really want to focus in on the who, the what, and the when. So we really want our producers and our business and industry and our associations to really focus on what really needs to happen now and who is going to kind of step up and take charge of that, and then when do we want to complete it by, whether it's six months, a year, two years, whatever the case may be. And this is really an opportunity for anybody to come with their input because you want it to really be a cooperative setting. The more the merrier. We want a really good cross-section. We want to see our farmers and ranchers there. We want to see our agribusinesses there, and we want to see our associations, our partners that are leading the industry on the front. We want everybody to come together. Definitely, it's not a state-run summit. It is a cooperative approach from all areas. There is no cost to attend, but you are asking people to register more for uh, materials for attendees and, of course, meals as well? There is absolutely no cost to it. We will have uh, a social the night before, and there will be an eggs and issues breakfast the next morning at 7, and then as well as a lunch. So, yes, we want people to come on and register for that, and they can register at our website, and that's agriculture.ks.gov slash summit. And it's really about the future of Kansas agriculture and where it takes it. I kind of compare it to if somebody belongs to a professional organization each year, they kind of reevaluate their goals and objectives and where they want to head for the next year. In this case, we're talking about an entire industry. Where do we want to see ourselves six months to five years down the road? That is Russell Plashka, Agribusiness Development Director with the Kansas Department of Agriculture, who joins us on the Kansas Soybean Update. It's brought to you by the Kansas Soybean Commission. The Soybean Checkoff, progress powered by Kansas farmers. Learn more at kansassoybeans.org. For Kansas Soybeans, I'm Greg Akagi. Hope you enjoyed this week's Kansas Soybean Update. Stay with us after the break as Kyle Bauer visits with David Rosenberger with Arrow Farms. What if sustainability were synonymous with U.S. soy? If energy efficiency, water quality, and soil health help define U.S. soy's value. That future is here, the time is now. To meet end-user demands, the Soybean Checkoff is committing to sustainability that's achievable, worthwhile, and enduring. A message from the Kansas Soybean Commission, the Soybean Checkoff, progress powered by Kansas farmers. Kim Mandarin with Hardy Insurance. I'm here to help you with all of your farm and ranch needs. When it comes to protecting your operation and your family, you need a name you can trust at a price you can afford. Call me today or visit hardyaviationins.com. 
KFRM is one of the largest farm radio stations in the nation, dedicated to informing and entertaining rural listeners from northern Oklahoma to southwestern Nebraska. You can catch KFRM in many ways. Of course, 550 on the AM dial, streaming at KFRM.com, or on your smartphone by going to the TuneIn Radio app, or on Ag AM in Kansas on Tuesdays, and Facebook every day of the week. KFRM, tune us in. You'll be glad you did. Next time you see a beautiful field of corn, reach out and thank the farmers who work tirelessly to raise corn for livestock feed, renewable fuels, and exports to feed a growing world population. The farmers on the Kansas Corn Commission work for Kansas Corn with grower-funded checkoff dollars that support foreign and domestic market development, research, promotion, and education to expand opportunities for Kansas farmers. To learn more, visit kscorn.com. This segment brought to you by SureCrop. Liquid crop nutrition delivered right to your farm. We're back. Now we learn more about the innovation of vertical farms with special guest David Rosenberger with Aero Farms. Hi, this is Kyle Bauer. I have the opportunity to visit with David Rosenberg with Aero Farms, and I'm just amazed at the technology that they're using. Um, it's certainly a new generation of agriculture. I'm just going to let you explain to the viewers um, how your farm works. I'm happy to, Kyle. So we're a vertical farming company. That means we grow without sun, without soil, row after row of growth, of growth plans. So in replace of soil, we use cloth. It's actually made out of recycled plastic. In replace of sun, we use spectrum delivered from LEDs, light emitting diodes. We grow in warehouses as opposed to greenhouses. So if you envision these long tunnels, about 80 feet long, five feet wide, about every three feet, you have another growth plane. Underneath the cloth, we mist nutrition of the root structure. So we're called aero farms in part because we grow in air and in part because it's aeroponics. We mist nutrition of the root structure. Roots want oxygen, leaves want carbon dioxide. We give the plant what it wants, how it wants it, where it wants it to optimize plant growth. Net net, our productivity per square foot is about 130 times higher than a field farmer, meaning what we could grow in one acre, it would take otherwise 130 acres to grow it in the field. Our crop turns are about every 16 days, that's 22 crop turns a year, and we grow, our growing systems use approximately 95% less water to grow a plant. Also growing without pesticides, herbicides, fungicides. At Aero Farms, we we're the world leader in the space. We've just built our ninth farm. It's also the largest vertical farm in the world. We have uh, financial backers like Prudential Financial and Goldman Sachs. In, this, in our ninth one, we took an old steel factory that we repurposed to this big farm. And now we're growing to, we're selling to customers like ShopRite and Whole Foods. Well, you also, it's become uh, almost, I mean, I'll call it factory farm, because, but I don't consider that anything but a compliment in that absolutely everything is controllable and you get to harvest regularly, so your labor, uh, your folks work for you full time and, and everything is predictable. That's true. We have automation in seeding, harvesting, cleaning, and packaging. Uh, and we are working, we employ year-round. Uh, our, our people are involved in most of it. It's like, uh, of the farm workers, about 75% unskilled workers. And we're growing, by the way, leafy green vegetables. We've grown about 300 different varieties of leafy greens. Uh, each farm focuses on probably uh, 20. And we're working to optimize not just yield, but taste, texture, nutritional value. Where the criticism of indoor agriculture is product doesn't taste good, conversely, the complemented aero farms is this is the best product we've ever had. So, for example, people like kale because it's very nutritious. They don't like it because it's typically very bitter and very rough. We could stress a plant in a way to make a kale more tender as well as less bitter. And we could make an arugula, for example, more peppery. We're visiting with Dave, David Rosenberg. He's with Arrow Farms. This is Kyle Bauer reporting. Back to you, Jamie. Thanks, Kyle. Come back after this break for this week's Angus Report. Valley Vet Supply is devoted to providing information and professional quality products at reasonable prices. Valley Vet, Valley Vet, Valley Vet Supply. 
Earlier in my life, I rode bucking horses and rodeos, and my shoulders took such a beating, and that was probably the reason for having several previous surgeries on both shoulders. About a year ago, I decided that I didn't want to have another surgery, and so I contacted Kansas Regenerative Medicine, took their treatment process. It was relatively pain-free. Now, after eight months, my shoulders have healed to the point where I think I'm probably 90 to 95 percent of normal. It takes a couple of months to start to see results and feel real progress. That continued to increase gradually until now at approximately eight months. And I'm extremely pleased. I've got full range of motion. I can lift weights. I can throw. I can do uh, a lot of things that uh, I couldn't do without a lot of pain previously. So I'm, I'm tickled to death with the results and I'd recommend this process to anyone. Ag Promo Source is a unique group of marketing specialists with one mission, help your ag business grow. Each affiliate has their own area of expertise and they work together to bring you advice, products and services. To get started, visit agpromosource.com. Ag Promo Source, together we grow. This segment brought to you by Kansas Farm Bureau, the voice of agriculture. To join today or more information, go to kfb.org or find us on Facebook and Twitter. Welcome back to Farm Factor and the Angus Report. Well, we all grew up in the, around the feedlot when we were little, obviously coming from a good German family. The work ethics got pushed on us pretty hard. And, and then we got the passion for it. We all loved it. Gerald Timmerman talks about being raised on his family's small feeding operation near Springfield, Nebraska. When he was 28 years old, Timmerman's father offered him and his younger brothers a chance to take charge of the family business. One of the things that my father did did us a great favor is buying the company, not giving the company. So we had to assume a lot of responsibility. He didn't sign on any credit for us or anything. We had to build our own credit. And uh, I think if you ask our wives, that was a bone of contention. I think and we went about close to 10 years, seven days a week without ever taking a day off, every one of us. And, and, uh, and as we you know, went through, we just drew a salary. Four brothers were equal partners from day one. No titles, no bonuses, just a simple business plan that was built on hard work. Been in the, what I call a lot of storms, uh, from the dairy buyout to, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I think it's just part of the business. You take it in stride. We were so, so fortunate that we had a lot of good mentors that went through, you know, a lot of things that we were going to go through. And luckily, we listened. Just like he listens when beef consumers send demand signals. They tell us what they want and how they want it. And that's what we got to produce for them. And I think we've got to get that mentality of saying we will give them what they want. And if you give them what they want, you can rest assured you're going to have a profit. You'll be re rewarded for your work. It's easier to go downhill than it is to push something uphill. Timmerman will receive the Industry Achievement Award at the 2018 Feeding Quality Forum. The meeting is set for August 28th to the 29th in Sioux City, Iowa. You know, when you get into business, you got to be smart. Smart is an IQ. You know, just savvy, hungry, and have a little humility, and you can have a pretty good career. Visit feedingqualityforum.com to attend Timmerman's reception or any of the forum activities. I'm Bob Cervera. Stay with us. We'll be back after the break with Plain Talk. 
Sure Crop Fertilizers was started by my father, Don Sherman, and my mother, Shirley Sherman. Family business has started in the 80s. We predominantly focus on plant nutrients and what we can do to give growers better responses for with the fertilizer dollars that they do and what we can do to you know, make those things work better for the grower. We're based out of Seneca, Kansas. We work with growers in their soil analysis to figure out what they need and then we can put those in a blend that gives them the best results and so that we can deliver that direct to their farm so that they have those nutrients where they need them, when they need them, and so that they can apply them in a manner that's, that's very efficient to them and, and works well on their planting systems and what they're doing. Sure Crop Fertilizers has been around for a long time. We always say we're, we're big enough to take care of everything you need, but yeah, we're small enough to do it quickly. You can get a hold of us at 1-800-635-4743. Um, our website is surecropfertilizers.com, and you can always email me at corey at surecropfertilizers.com, and with any questions you have, we'll be glad to answer and work with you. I'm Derek Sawyer, and I'm a fourth-generation Kansas farmer. I've known all my life I wanted to farm this land near McPherson, which was my grandfather's before me. I'm Katie Sawyer, a journalist who never dreamed I'd live my life on the farm until I met Derek. We've married our worlds to help educate consumers about the rural lifestyle and all that farmers do to provide safe and affordable food. Watch our story and the stories of other young Kansas food producers at kansaslivingmagazine.com slash farmer. This segment brought to you by Kansas Corn. Learn more at kscorn.com. Welcome back. Now let's see what Kyle and Dwayne are discussing today on Plain Talk. Hi, this is Kyle Bauer with Plain Talk with the button-pushing Dwayne Taves. Here I be on my side of the board. The guy in control. It's not often the employee gets to rule the boss. So am I the boss? I'm just going to take that. Am as I the right. boss? I'm going to take that as a moral victory. I would your like to have that written down somewhere. <laughs> your fact or fiction question today, Kyle Bauer. Grapes will explode if you heat them in a microwave. Fact or fiction? Well, I think there'd be a little hole in the end where the stem came out, that there'd be plenty of place for the air to come out of them. But why would you say that if it wasn't true? I have never microwaved a grape I've microwaved several things that have exploded over the years. Um, I'll go with true. It is true. I don't think that's true. I think you said it was true. I, well, the place I read it said it was true. Now, think about this. You're right. There is a stem hole that when you pull a grape off. but Maybe you didn't pull it off. Maybe you left it on the stem. Well, if you left it on the stem. Or the other thing is it heats so rapidly. It and if can't you get out. a single grape in a microwave. Unless you got a really poor microwave, I would think you would superheat that faster than it was able to, to come out of there. Respirate. Out there. I think I need to go try that in your microwave. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, do you hard boil eggs? Yes. So, in you, a pot of water. And you are are you good at hard boiling eggs? Um, I probably overdo them by most people's standards, but I have. Does it have a green ring around the outside? When you get them done and break no, them open, not, is it green? Not not that far. Well, if it's not green, you're not overdoing them. Okay. But yeah. I have an aversion to raw eggs. Okay. I don't know why. I mean, it's it's just a thing. I, I can't tolerate. Okay. So you don't even like your eggs over easy? Not particularly. Okay. No. You want the yolks completely done? Yeah. Okay. Well, I am our... I am our Egg boiler in our family. Okay. Because my Egg wife... technique involves? Just a timer. a timer. It's just as simple as that. Okay. You but, bring it to a boil? Uh, you do, but um, but the thing is, I don't like to break my eggs when I'm boiling them either. And so I leave them on high, but I like to watch them. Because have you ever watched an egg before they come to a boil? The, the, really? The, it's the air comes out of them. You have little oh, trails little of bubbles, bubbles coming out from them. Right. I mean, as hard as that... Yolk is, I mean, I'm sorry, that shell is. It's, it's porous. It's porous. Okay. And you see, so I like to get the water just hot enough that I can have all the eggs with those little bubblers coming out of it. At the same time. At the same time. Well, that's exactly. Uniform heat. Well, well, it's not that hard because all the water is the same temperature in the pan. Ah, uh, true. Yeah. And so, but if you have it just a little too low, some of them are coming out, some are not. If you have it too high and it's, and it's actually boiling, you can't, too fast, you, you can't see it. See it. Right. Yeah. So, you know, some man just has his simple pleasures, and one of mine is that. Watching the air bubble. The, the reason the that my wife likes me to do it is all my eggs are a nice yellow yolk. 
Really? And they don't have the green around the outside. Yeah. And the whole key is, as soon as they come to a boil, keep them warm for 20 minutes and put them cold. Cool them out. Now, how hard is that? But it appears that it's extremely hard because it appears a lot of people can't do it. Thanks for joining us. I'm your host, Jamie Bloom, and I hope you enjoyed today's show. See you next week on Farm Factor. Closed captioning brought to you by Egg Promo Source. Together we grow. Learn more at eggpromosource.com.